Good morning, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Today, I'm talking about mast cell activation in response to food antigens. Uh, I've been talking about mast cell activation syndrome a lot uh, of late. Just to give the quick preamble, mast cell activation syndrome is a term that was coined in the 1980s and very much popularized by two different camps of doctors, particularly around 2010. I cite Dr. Lawrence Afrin, he's a hematologist who worked with chronically ill people and basically found that they all had this reoccurring theme underlying thread of biological dysfunction involving their mast cells, which are typically something we note with like allergic disorders. But he was seeing that these mast cells created systemic inflammatory responses as well. And maybe the reason why someone is chronically fatigued, maybe why they have bone pain, maybe why they have weird reactions to environmental stimuli. And he started treating them with different antihistamines and other medications. And a lot of these individuals had really significant improvements in their health outcomes. So he wrote a book and um, I've been delving into the literature on this issue because I've worked with autoimmune patients for 12 years now. And I'm seeing that this mast cell activation syndrome is probably the elephant in the room we weren't seeing with autoimmune patients because there seems to be an overlap for a lot of people. So an individual may have rheumatoid arthritis, but they may have mast cell activation syndrome. Maybe somebody has celiac disease, but they might also have mast cell activation syndrome. The reason why today's broadcast is so important, <clears throat> and I'm very excited about it, is that this article comes from the top research journal in the world. And one issue that a lot of mast cell patients run into, and that I run into when I'm trying to make referrals, is that mast cell activation syndrome almost has become like fibromyalgia, uh, what fibromyalgia was uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, where it's almost one description in the rheumatology textbooks was that fibromyalgia patients are met with such ire and ire refers by doctors. So this almost like anger um, that doctors project onto patients who are chronically ill, who look otherwise normal and mast cell activation syndrome patients. In my experience, some doctors are open to it. Some doctors are aware of it. Some doctors are totally not aware of it and not open to it at all. So, with that being said, there is some vindication, um, I don't know vindication, but there's definitely uh, becoming more and more awareness of MCAS. And we have a really notable journal, one of the top two scientific journals in the world that are now acknowledging mast cell activation syndrome as it pertains in this case to irritable bowel syndrome. So I'm gonna hide this, I'm gonna show this, this is a disclaimer, pause the video, read that. Not intended for medical advice, just giving you information. I'm gonna show this one, okay. So in this article, the authors did two things. They looked at mice first, and then they also looked at a, a smaller sample of human beings. Uh, studying the bowel in human beings and the intestines is much more difficult because we have to, you know, get into that tissue. It's a much more invasive process. Sadly, uh, one could say with mice, you know, they, they're able to see things in their tissues because it's a scientific project, much easier than it is a human being, if you know what I mean. So what they did is that they hypothesized that infections were the trigger to this food intolerance that many IBS patients have. And we've known for a long time that there's this thing called post-infectious IBS, where a lot of irritable bowel syndrome patients develop their condition after having a, a gastrointestinal infection frequently with a bacteria. So an irritable bowel syndrome are individuals who have pain and distension, bloating. Lots of times it's relieved by having a bowel movement. They have abnormal bowel movements, constipation, diarrhea, mixed one or the other. Um, there are different criteria for diagnosing it, but basically that's what irritable bowel syndrome is in the absence of something like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or celiac disease. So what they did, more and more preambles. So what they did is that 
they expose these mice to a bacterial infection called Citrobacter, and they also fed the mice ova albumin, um, which is going to have a certain dietary protein effect, while they had the infection. And they compared them to mice who didn't have the infection. And as you can see in this diagram, what they saw was that the bacterial infection led, led to a break of oral tolerance as we term it. So oral tolerance notes that you have trillions of bacteria in your intestines and colon. We eat foods all the time. Our immune system has to differentiate between something that's really dangerous and something that's innocuous. And so that's what oral tolerance is. You don't want your immune system to freak out and kill your intestines as is what happens in celiac disease or your colon and ulcerative colitis or from your mouth to your anus and Crohn's disease. So what they were doing is that they're basically saying, okay, let's look at oral tolerance and does that break down with an infection? And they found that it did. So the bacterial infection led to so much inflammation that the immune system then went into high alert, started trying to kill the bacteria. And in the process, it leads to kind of an immune overactivation where then the immune system is now in perpetuity activated against this, back, this uh, food antigen, the ova albumin. And what they saw is that even after the infection cleared, this persistent dietary intolerance kept going. And it was mediated through the mast cells. So there was this correlation between what we call dietary antigen specific IgEs. IgEs are a type of immunoglobulin most associated with allergies, IgE allergies. And these IgEs work in concert with the mast cells. So now what happened was that the mast cells then became sensitized to the ova albumin, the food allergen, and they kept releasing chemicals locally in the intestines and it sensitized the pain nerves. So I just did a broadcast on mast cell activation syndrome and pain, talking about how what these mast cells release, they release histamine, they release other uh, substances like interleukins that make our pain nerves send more signals. So they showed this in this research article in these mice, they definitively showed the, the sequence of steps that I'm outlining. Um, and so it's pretty cool because now we have the exact mechanism. So once the infection clears, the mice now keep reacting to the ova albumin, their mast cells degranulate, their mast cells are sensitized. And this was not a systemic response. It was just in their intestines. So that's where for MCAS patients, it's always kind of difficult to test for. And I run repeated testing. That's what Dr. Afrin says to do. And lots of times you have to keep testing because we're looking for responses that may just be in one tissue of the body, maybe in multiple tissues. Maybe you have to see someone in an attack to see an elevated histamine or tryptase response. And that's what they saw. They saw a local upregulation of genes, epigenetic uh, modulation of genes involving tryptase, which is one of the key things we look for in mast cell activation syndrome. So this is a, a really, really great step forward in my opinion for mast cell patients yes this one is just on ibs and and food intolerances and oh yeah they furthered this study into human subjects and they basically found the same thing it was a smaller subset of individuals but they found the same thing this research is so notable that it's in like the top two scientific journals in the world so this is really really great uh hopefully we have more articles coming forward in the future on uh, the systemic effects of mast cell activation syndrome that so many of you deal with. And let me know your thoughts, questions, concerns on this, uh, what questions you have. I'm, as I mentioned on Tuesday, I'm trying to do these broadcasts now twice a week and to bring you good, good information as best as we can. So uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and email us at info at gatesbrainhealth.com. And uh, I'll be back next week for something else. Okay, have a good day.